suspension's key. And that's like I said earlier, look, we hear from producers after it's already an issue. So if it is an issue that you have wolves in the area, maybe not in your calving grounds, something to, to stop that before it becomes an issue is huge. And electric fence is a relatively cheap, reliable source on how to prevent some of these encounters before they happen. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversation podcast, where we talk about all things related to ranching by connecting you to peer ranchers and industry leaders to improve the profitability of your operation and your lifestyle. Now, if you are looking for a community of ranchers, sign up for my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are mastermind events for ranchers. You join a Zoom link and you sit down and have a conversation with other ranchers and industry leaders about specific topics that help you improve your operation and face the challenges that we face as an industry as a whole. Now, if you want immediate ranch management advice, go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com slash newsletter and sign up. When you sign up, I will send you a free PDF with 22 ranch management tips from the ranching gurus who have been on my show and poured out their knowledge for all to hear. With that, be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram by following Cattle Convos. You can connect with me there or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com to find anything you may need. I'm excited to meet you and let's get on with the show. All right, Liam, you've been on the show before, but today we're going to switch it up a little bit and we're actually going to talk about predator control and management using different fencing strategies. And we're going to talk about the predators in your area, as well as really any type of animals that producers or cattlemen are trying to keep out of their pastures and how to still keep their cattle in. So with that, For those who haven't heard you on the show before, talk a little bit about where your territory is in the country and what type of predators you help ranchers keep out. So I'm a territory manager for Gallagher in the Pacific Northwest to cover Washington, Northern Idaho and Eastern Oregon. Um, When it comes to predator management and wildlife management, mostly out here, we deal with wolves, cougars, bears, coyotes. Um, When it comes to other wildlife animals, we deal with a lot of elk issues and deer, um, you know, working over hay fields or getting into your hay stacks in the wintertime. So work with a variety of animals out in the Northwest, but throughout the nation, Gallagher works with wild hogs and cougars and I mean, things everywhere, all sorts of different predators. So we got to get creative sometimes, but a lot of different solutions throughout the Pacific Northwest, United States and the world even. Well, I'm excited for this interview and to hear kind of what solutions you've been helping producers put in place. So let's kind of start there. Let's maybe talk a little bit on the wolf side. Um, What do some strategies look like there as far as how you kind of help ranchers um, manage to keep wolves out of their pastures, if at all possible, through fencing strategies? Usually the most we deal with wolves is during calving season. Sadly, we get contacted after there's already an issue and we have to maybe the next year or implement stuff quickly for the current year. Um, Usually fish and wildlife is involved, trying to manage, mitigate that predation. Um, What what we've done in the past is something called turbo flagery. And what it is, is around a calving area, you'd set up a hot wire, but the hot wire would have electrified tape or sometimes just ribbon hanging down. Um, and it flutters in the wind and it's got the electrical element um, and it kind of throws off the wolves. They used it, I think, back in, back in Russia to hunt wolves. They'd kind of funnel them and they wouldn't go beyond the, the lines and then they could kill the wolves then. So it's kind of an old technique with just rope and ribbon, but now we use the electrical element. Now it's one strategy when dealing with wolves, you got to deal with a multiple different range riders, electric fence, those crazy things you see at the used car sales yet. People try those too. I mean, there's, it's one step, but we've used a lot of turbo flagery around calving pins or if guys are turning out into the mountains, they'll, you know, put cows and calves in a big 
open area with this around there until they get all the cows together. So that's one strategy. Um, we've done some in Eastern Oregon with wolves where you pretty much just have to build a seven strand, four foot fence that is pretty, pretty bomb proof for anything to get in or out. So um, other strategies, night pinning, some guys will have to pin their cattle up at night and just have a fully enclosed electrified fence around them before they turn them out again in the morning. So from a management standpoint, or maybe even a success standpoint, what are some of those differences with the turbo flaggery and that seven wire fence from a management standpoint, you know, what types of producers gravitate towards one or the other? Yeah. So if you're turning out on some forest service or DNR ground or something, you might not have the time to build that infrastructure of that seven strand fence, or, you know, it might not be conducive to the whole grazing management plan on the place. So you might need to use that turbo flaggery where if it's at your home place and you can build and put the energy into a seven strand fence, that's kind of the management aspect, time, money, and where you're at really is kind of how we determine how we're going to put the right kind of fencing up for a producer. So is this something where when producers decide to make the change to either turbo flaggery or the seven strand fence, where it's going to impact the type of energizer they're going to have, what does that look like? So yeah, the energy, I mean, that depends on the kind of ground we're on, um, how big of a pasture we're doing. If you're using turbo flaggery, you don't need as big of a charger because it's usually just a single strand application, whereas a seven strand fence is gonna require more juice to fill that essentially pipe, you know, fill it full of the proper amount of power. Okay. And usually you have power available if you're at home, you know, but if you're out in range ground, you might have to use a smaller solar or something. Okay, thank you for explaining that. And I really appreciate how you went into how fencing is one part of the solution to uh, managing the wolf population and keeping them out of your cows during calving you're during that calving period, but how it does take you know multiple different actions to really control that. It does, yeah. And I mean, they get used to one, and you have to switch to another, or you might change it up season to season so they don't get used to whatever you're trying to implement. So there, there's a lot of different aspects that come into predator control. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about, you know, not necessarily predator control, but keeping game out of your haystacks, your feed resources. What are you seeing producers in your area do in that regard to kind of protect their feed source? Because that is a major issue. When it comes to pasture or hay ground, you know, um, elk and deer can elk especially can cause havoc on fence. So you either need to build a really short fence that the elk can clear, or you need to build a really tall fence that the elk will respect. And that's what I've had to do a lot on Western Washington, especially, um, we build high fence. Um, it's pretty prevalent in Texas to keep animals in if it's a hunting uh, reserve, but also to keep things out. Um, and it's pretty successful, but you do need a big energizer for elk. Elk have hollow hair follicles, and their body fat isn't isn't huge compared to their feet. And so they got hard, smaller feet. And so it's hard to get power into an elk, let alone to ground them out and get them shocked. So you got to use a pretty big fencer on that. A, you're building big fence and then the animal type. For sure, we need big power. So when you say big fence and short fence, like what's the size of fence that typically you'd say an elk can clear that? And then how tall are your fences where you're keeping them out? Because they're if high I'm fence. out on range ground and... I don't want to have to fix that fence all the time. I'm building a three foot fence that the elk can clear. If I'm building an exclusion fence, we're building an eight to 10 foot tall, probably 12 strand high tensile wire fence. So yeah, that would be a full exclusion. So with that, with the elk, are you using different types of wire? You mentioned that you need a powerful energizer, but are you using different types of wire or what does that look like? For permanent fencing, we're just using high tensile. Yep. That's going to be your biggest bang for the buck when it comes to conductivity of the wire. And then along with price per foot, you can put your posts at 40 foot apart and it's still going to be very, very conductive. You wouldn't use temporary fence for elk exclusion, unless it's like on a haystack that you're constantly in and out of, and you know, you have to move it around because your stacks getting shorter throughout the winter. Then we might switch things up a little bit. Okay. So when producers are 
thinking about building these fencing structures, is it something where it's usually a combination of a relationship with their Gallagher rep as well as, you know, their game and fish department on the state end? Or, you know, what do they really need to be successful and have a good plan when they're working through predator control and fencing? Yeah, so working with us, but the states, if you are getting the state involved or you are on state ground, they might have their own requirements when it comes to infrastructure, how to build the proper braces, um, especially if they're putting some money into it, they might have their own requirements on what products they want you to use or general design ideas. Usually if we're on the ground with the producer and the fish and wildlife or DNR, usually it's a three-way conversation on what we think would be best, what the producer needs, plus what the fish and wildlife management program is. So it all kind of varies, but it is all case by case for sure. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, we talked about what's going on in your area, but before we got on this interview, we talked a little bit about hogs in Texas. So can you talk a little bit about some of those solutions? I know that's not your territory, but you've got connections down there. <laughs> yeah, so hogs in Texas, we've done quite a bit in Hawaii too. Um, again, it's, it just depends on the animal that we're keeping in or out, right? So we don't need a really high fence. They're not great jumpers. But uh, for full exclusion, we would do a high tensile wire fence, probably three foot tall that um, we get probably pretty hot, usually a hot ground fence, especially in some parts of Texas where it might get pretty dry. So to get full exclusion, we'd want pretty close wire spacings. Um, and use, usually we're going to use a high tensile. We can do temporary fencing as well, but that that structure of that temporary fence is not as reliable as the high tensile wire fence would be. So when we look at the common mistakes that producers make when building these electric fences, are there any like different mistakes when it that you see producers make when they're managing for predators or are they the same similar mistakes that happen when they're implementing any electric fence really? In any general wildlife fencing, when it comes to predators or elk or deer or whatever, putting that fence right on that maybe you got woods on one side and your pasture on the other, putting that fence right at that line is usually a mistake because the elk are gonna like immediately jump out of the woods and hit it. Having a bit of a buffer. So when they stick their head out and kind of look, see what's going on and then they meet the fence. That's something that we see too common is people put it right on the edge and then the elk and the deer don't have time to learn or the wolves, you know, they might already be committed to getting after a calf, but then they hit the fence and then they've gotten through it. So giving that animal a little time to investigate and see that that fence is there is usually pretty key. And just like all our fence, even if we're keeping cows in and horses grounding, so many people, depending on your type of ground that you're actually on, using the proper amount of ground rods or a hot ground or a ground return fence, that is key to success on all of these fencing types. Okay. Well, before we kind of wrap up today, I think you've really done an excellent job explaining, you know, fencing in general, especially on the predator control standpoint or keeping elk or deer out of your feed sources. But is there anything else you really want the audience to take home today or any one mission, any one message that if they leave with anything, they should at least remember this? Prevention's key. And that's like I said earlier, look, we hear from producers after it's already an issue. So if it is an issue that you have wolves in the area, maybe not in your calving grounds, something to, to stop that before it becomes an issue is huge. And electric fence is a relatively cheap, reliable source on how to prevent some of these encounters before they happen, which is key. Before it happens, think about the possibility, you know, talk to your neighbors, you probably know what's going on, but we don't like getting the call after, after the fact. And you don't either. You're probably pretty stressed about it as it is. All right. Well, thank you very much for being on the show today, Liam. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.